Hi, and welcome once again to the First Christian Church of Lawton, Oklahoma. Welcome home. I'm so glad you took time out of your schedule to join us here this week in this special space as we continue our summer worship series, Quick Questions. Now, you've heard of acronyms before. They're words that are usually made up of the first letters of longer phrases, and then they're used in their place. Take the word scuba, for example. The word scuba is actually made up of the first letters of the sentence self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, or NASA, for example, which means the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So you've heard of acronyms, but have you ever heard of backronyms? A backronym is when we take an already known word and we put together a little sentence made up of the words with the first letter of each of the letters of the word uh, that conveys something of its meaning. I know it sounds complicated, but it's really simple. Take the word luck, for example. For many folks, luck signifies living under Christ's kindness. Or you've probably heard the backronym for the Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. But for a book of basic instructions, the Bible sure does have a lot of questions in it, doesn't it? Jesus himself asked a lot of questions during his teachings too. That's because questions, good questions, invite us to reflect, to think deeply, and to come to a new understanding about the world around us. In the Gospel reading we'll hear today, Jesus poses two great questions. What's a good image for God's kingdom? And what parable, riddle, or puzzle can I use to explain it? Today, we'll look at both of these questions as we seek to worship, learn, and grow together. Would you please pray with me? God of small seeds and mighty plants, you take our lives and with your love cause them to produce acts of loving kindness for you in this world. You hear our cries and find us when we're lost and wandering. You bring us home with you so that we may be made whole, rejoicing in your goodness. Help us to joyfully serve you all our days, knowing that you are always watching over us. Prepare our hearts to receive your word and our spirits to respond in eagerness to serve you during this time of worship as we celebrate your kingdom and its work in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. In the bulb there is a flower In the seed an apple tree In cocoons a hidden promise Butterflies will soon be free In the cold and snow of winter There's a spring that wants to be Unrevealed until its season Something God alone can see There's a song in every silence Sinking word and melody there's a dawn in every darkness bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery. Unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity. In our doubt there is believing in our life eternity in our death the resurrection at the last of victory unrevealed until its season something God alone can see let us pray Lord, we may not be able to confront dictators or challenge presidents. We may not have the capacity to divert resources or uplift entire communities. We may not have the voice to silence the noise of war or the words to negotiate peace between armies. But as we follow you, O Christ, we are able to do something. And so we pray that you would inspire us to commit to and act on the differences we can make. May we bring peace through small acts of gentleness and reconciliation, 
May we bring wealth through small contributions and collaborations. May we bring safety through small acts of consideration and acceptance. And may we bring wholeness through small acts of care and service. May our small differences be as seed scattered and sown. And may we have faith enough to believe that you, God of the harvest, will see fit to bring them to fruition in your time. And now, as Christ has taught his disciples, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now a reading from the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Then Jesus said, This is what God's kingdom is like. It's as though someone scatters seed on the ground, then sleeps and wakes night and day. The seed sprouts and grows, but the farmer doesn't know how. The earth produces crops all by itself, first the stalk, then the head, and then the full head of grain. Whenever the crop is ready, the farmer goes out to cut the grain because it's harvest time. He continued, what's a good image for God's kingdom? What parable can I use to explain it? Consider a mustard seed. When scattered on the ground, it's the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. But when it's planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all vegetable plants. It produces such tremendous branches that the birds in the sky are able to nest in its shade. With many such parables, he continued to give them the word as much as they were able to hear. He spoke to them only in parables, then explained everything to his disciples when he was alone with them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Here in this place, the new light is streaming. Shadows of doubt are vanished away. See in this space, our fears and our dreamings brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in, the lost and forsaken. Gather us in, our spirits in flame. Call to us now, and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty, gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lonely, give us the courage to enter the song. Here we receive new life in the waters, here we receive the bread of new birth. Here you shall call your sons and your daughters, call us anew to be salt for the earth. Give us to drink the wine of compassion, give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. Not just in buildings small and confining, not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place the new light is shining, now is God present, now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever, gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together, fire of love in our flesh and our bone.
we kind of jump into the middle of a set of teachings in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus has gathered around the crowds and gathered around his disciples in an attempt to communicate to them what God's kingdom is like and what it's about. Now, the kingdom of God is a phrase we use a lot in church, but we often take it for granted. We don't really tease out the implications of what this name, the kingdom of God, means. In the Old Testament, the prophets looked forward to what they called the great and terrible day of the Lord. It was a day when God would judge the nations of the world and every human inhabitant of it from the very beginning of creation until the end when God's judgment began. Here, those who are righteous are rewarded. Those who have done evil meet their recompense and their punishment. This is the great and terrible day of the Lord when God tears down the old order of things in creation and all of creation reacts in response to the movement of God. This idea, over time, turned into a notion of God's kingdom. That's the thing that would replace this present order. In the kingdom of God, there is shalom, or justice with peace, for all of the inhabitants of the earth. In God's kingdom, there is a place for everyone, and everyone is in their place. In God's kingdom, in Revelation, we're told there is an end to crying and sickness, mourning and pain, even death itself, because it is simply unmade. In God's kingdom, our relation to God is so direct and so intimate that there isn't even a sun to be found in the sky, because the light of God pervades all of creation, shining brightly, illuminating all that is. In God's kingdom, we have the potential of each and every human being, you and me included, actualized. We have the opportunity to be what we were always made to be. This is the kingdom of God. And as Christ is going around teaching, he begins looking for puzzles, riddles, parables to explain this kingdom to God's people. And the use of a parable as a teaching tool is an interesting thing. You'll hear me use that word parable interchangeably with puzzle or riddle, and that's because the words all really mean the same thing. A parable is sort of a word picture that one is supposed to think deeply about and reflect on. They're like, they're like time bombs. They're planted when you first hear them, and later as your subconscious mind works them over and over again, there is an aha moment, and realization occurs. Parables are a dynamic way of learning, and they're a way of learning that teaches the brain to look at the world differently. They enable us to think around corners, to find new and amazing solutions to problems that may seem otherwise intractable. And so, it's no surprise that as Jesus is talking to a group of people who are fixated on one very singular idea about what God's kingdom is, and to the Jewish folks of Jesus' day, this wouldn't be the kingdom I spoke to you about a moment ago. No, it would be a restoration of the political fortunes of Israel. It would be a kingdom just like Caesar had a kingdom, just like the United States has a government and a country. This would be a theocracy ruled by God where Israel stands in a privileged place. And Jesus understands that this idea of the kingdom of God has wormed its way into the psyche of his people so thoroughly that they need to be taught to think around corners, to get out and around it. And so as Jesus has the multitudes gathered around him, he asks the question, what parable can I use to describe God's kingdom? And so he begins with a story about a mustard seed. I love, love, love this parable. I love it for a number of reasons. I love it because it plays off of prophecy elsewhere in the Bible where we're told the kingdom of God is like a giant cedar tree growing up in Israel on the Temple Mount and all the Gentile nations will flock to it as birds of the air and nest in its branches. Jesus knows that image is in folks' mind. But what if, what if instead of a mighty regal cedar tree, what if we were talking about something a little different. Mustard in Jesus' day is a lot like it is in ours. Teeny tiny little round seeds that when sown or planted in the earth have the potential to grow up into tiny bushes. Tiny 
bushes, shrubs, really. I mean, ideal circumstances, you could probably get one maybe seven to nine feet tall, which is big for a bush, but it's hardly the kind of majestic tree that you would expect all the birds of the air to come and nest in its branches. But this is the image Jesus picks. The kingdom of God is like this. It's like something that starts off small and insignificant. In fact, mustard was rarely planted as a cash crop in the ancient Near East because it had a tendency to take over. It would continue to grow and to seed and to move out kind of like mint in your garden if you're a home gardener has a tendency to do. It just gets out of control so very quickly and so very easily. The other problem with mustard is it's a crop that you have to go back and replant every year. It doesn't just spring back up again out of the ground. And so it wasn't particularly desirable. And so if mustard doesn't grow up really huge, and if it isn't really regal and desirable like the cedars of Lebanon were in the Old Testament, why does Jesus choose to use it as a metaphor for the kingdom of God? You know, Growing up in the Midwest, and I'm sure this is the case in Oklahoma too, we in the summertime would have a preponderance of another kind of plant absolutely everywhere you would look. And here I'm talking about dandelions. Now, for most folks, these are a nuisance plant. They're a weed that they look to pluck up and get rid of as soon as they crop up in their lawn. Or we go to the garage and we pull out a bottle of Roundup to try to do away with it. But I remember when I was a kid, I remember being at my grandma Appleby's house and going out into their side yard, it was absolutely vast as a child. And I remember going out looking for flowers to pick a bouquet for my grandmother to show her how much I loved her when I was probably no older than five. I remember scooping up handful after handful of dandelions. And I remember coming inside, grinning ear to ear, holding them up to my grandmother and saying, here, I got you a bouquet, these are for you. And I remember the look on her face and the smile as she went over into her china cabinet. She got out her best leaded crystal vase. She filled it up with water and she dropped those dandelions in. And she gave them a place of honor there at the house right in the middle of the table in the entryway so everyone could see them when they came in. And that's because my grandmother saw in those dandelions, love, where anyone else would just see weeds. That relationship that I had with her enabled to see the, her to see the intentions of my heart. And here I was trying to use what I had at hand to do something to show something of my love and care for her. Similarly, as Jesus is talking about the mustard seed, seed by many as a problem plant, something to be rooted out, Jesus saw an opportunity to talk about the kingdom of God in a new and exciting way. Because of God's love, these aren't just shrubs or weeds scattered around the earth. These seemingly commonplace plants that are so easy to overlook are actually a metaphor for the way God's kingdom works in the world. It starts just like mustard seeds, as something small, seemingly insignificant. And as it works its way into the ground and begins to grow up, it has the tendency to grow up in surprising and unexpected ways, even places where we may not have planted it, in ways that seem to take over whatever bed or area it is placed in. And it grows up so surprisingly huge that at the end of the day, the end result isn't a harvest of mustard like you'd expect, but it's a home for for birds of every feather. Do you get it? Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Jesus' image of the kingdom of God is a subversive one. It's one that shows us that in God's kingdom there is a home for everyone. It's one that doesn't exalt one nation over another, one people over another. It's one that is inclusive and allows room for all. It's one that can grow wildly, and it's one that you and I are invited to sow. See, working backwards, that's really Jesus' point in that other parable. The sower goes out and sows this seed. And that sower is you and me and Jesus and the apostles and prophets and everyone who has gone before us. We are tasked with the responsibility of going out and proclaiming through word and deed the inbreaking kingdom of God in the world. 
That's our job, to plant the seeds. And as Jesus explains in that first parable, we don't cause them to grow. That's God's work. We don't cause them to sprout. We don't cause them to take root. We don't cause them to come up with a head of grain or to become ripe for the harvest. That is all God's responsibility. Yours and mine, our responsibility to the kingdom of God, is to bear witness to it in word and deed. You may have heard before some folks paraphrasing St. Francis of Assisi as they look to the Christian obligation to share our faith with the rest of the world. Francis once said, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. Jesus, however, just got done appointing apostles to go out and carry this message to the ends of the earth to continue in his ministry of saving, healing, and delivering. He just got done explaining the parable of the sower where the sower goes out and sows all kinds of seeds. And there are all sorts of different responses. Some spring up too quickly. Others are snatched before they have a chance to take root. The point of this parable of the kingdom is to encourage you and I to go out and do what we have been called, commissioned, created to do. And that is to proclaim God's gracious and glorious, inclusive invitation to all those we encounter. Sure, absolutely, by deeds, but words are necessary. It's imperative that we let folks know when we do the things we do, whether it is our agape ministry modeling a shalom where all have enough to eat, all are included, all are fed bread without cost. Whether it's our simply telling someone that we'll be there for them when they need us. Because Christ is always there for us. Because this is our calling as Christians to share God's love in tangible and concrete ways. The deeds are beautiful, wonderful things. But if we've noticed in our life those seeds that we plant don't seem to be taking root, we're told not to lose heart, but to continue the work of planting, to continue the work of proclamation, to continue doing the saving, healing, and delivering deeds that Christ commissioned his first followers to do as they go out into the world, because that's God's kingdom. It's not a kingdom you or I can bring about any more than we can force a seed to take root and germinate. It's a kingdom that is God's miraculous, gracious, life-giving doing at the end of the day. Our role is to be witnesses. Our role is to sow. Our role is to continue praying that prayer Christ taught his disciples. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is God's work for us in the world. And it's my hope as you continue turning these parables around in your mind that new and explosive ideas and possibilities will occur to you. And it's my hope that when they do, you're bold enough to share them and to keep planting. Amen. Even as Jesus called his disciples one by one, by name. So the risen Christ calls each of you one by one by name to come and to share about this table in a community of love. Join him not because you're good, but because Christ wants you. Eat and drink with Christ within the universal fellowship of those who are loved without reservation, just as they are. At this place where all are welcome. Would you please pray with me? author of life, we thank you this day for the life found in unexpected places. Ordinary bread and an ordinary cup surprise us with new life and new possibilities through the transformative power of your spirit. Ordinary people with ordinary lives surprise us with a glimpse of your kingdom as we remember your presence and dine with one another. May we be blessed with the eyes to see and the ears to hear the extraordinary nature of of the ordinary, when it is seen in the light of Christ. Amen. For what I have received from the Lord I have also delivered unto you, that on the night in which he was betrayed our Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the same way also after supper he took the cup saying 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so for the remembrance of me. This is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. For my brothers and sisters, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim our Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. In God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and have given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out now in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory now and all our days. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us here yet again as we look to worship, learn, and grow together. Until we meet again, my friends, may God give you new visions to take advantage of new possibilities to go out and reach new people. May the Holy Spirit empower us all to do this work. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Goodbye and God bless.